of course, you know, very juicy for organizing this series and for inviting me us to be here today. It's a pleasure. So uh, I am Nataria Dival. I joined Thermo uh, two years ago. Uh, I'm going to be celebrating the two year anniversary in January 2023. And um, before that, I was the director of uh, two electron microscopy laboratories in NCI uh, in the Bethesda campus. So I was doing all the traditional conventional TEM, so pathology TEM, clinical TEM. And the second lab was all the high resolution TEM, so single particle, micro electron diffraction, and cryotomography as well. So I have I don't want to think about how many years I'm doing already this because I'm already too old, but uh, I have more than 20 years of experience with electron microscopy, so it's quite crazy and I love it. So I am a bit biased about the technique, but I hope you know today I can explain to you my passion about cryo EN and how this can help you, you know, to understand your projects. So let me hopefully this works. Okay, here you are. So uh because I don't know specifically, you know, the expertise in the audience, you know, uh, if you already have familiarity with cryo microscopy or not, I would like to start very simple, uh, you know, slide to put everyone on the same page here in the audience. So you can see we have plenty of different imaging techniques. Uh, you can go, you know, the green ones, they are the light microscopy, super resolution, the conventional SCNTEM. Like they are very, very good techniques if you really want to have the large field of view but they are quite bad if you want to have the resolution, okay? On the other part of the spectrum, in purple, you have NMR and you have crystallography, like they are mostly the opposite, you know? They are very good techniques, oh, sorry about that, it's moving alone. So they are very good techniques for, uh, you know, high resolution, but you are losing all the field of view, okay? Because you are working with a small proteins, small compounds, etc. And in the middle, you know, in blue, you have the cryo-electron tomography and single particle analysis. Like that, it is a very good balance because you can still get a very good resolution and still have as well a decent field of view, especially if you are working with tomography samples. So again, the main structural biology techniques here, as you can see, are crystallography, NMR, and cryo -EN. Crystallography is still, you know, I will say one of the most important techniques here for the structural biology. And you can see NMR is kind of a plateauing right now. And you can see uh, in yellow, you know, cryo-electron microscopy is becoming more and more a hot technique. You know, specifically after the 2017, when we got the uh, Nobel Prize with Joaquin Frank, uh, you know, uh, Richard Henderson and Jack Duboche, the technique started exploding as well. So new technologies in terms of hardware, cameras and softwares are making cryo a very, very important technique for structural biology studies. And as you can see, we are expecting in the next probably five years, so even less than that, to become almost the same as crystallography or even better. To be honest with you, if you go to the PDB data bank right now and you are looking for membrane proteins, the majority of those, like they are very difficult to crystallize, are already coming from cryo and single particle analysis. So it's a huge, you know, uh, important, important technique for that. I don't need to convince you guys here. Uh, the majority of you are like me. We are very biased about cryo -EN. We love cryo -EN. But for the people that are still starting cryo -EN, I want to highlight how cryo -EN, again, is becoming very, very important technique for characterizing proteins and pathogens. And as you can imagine, you know, the human body has over 80,000 to 400K proteins. And it's very important to understand how these proteins are interacting with each other in the body to develop new therapies, new vaccines, new drugs, et cetera. So I want to highlight today mainly three examples. Like they, you know, they were published recently, working in collaboration with the UK. Uh, in the middle, you can see uh, La Jolla Institute in San Diego and Stanford where we can highlight the importance of cryo and single particle analysis and how this technique is being very, very important in research in human health. So for example, in the left side, you can see the new tautopathy that was discovered uh, uh, you know, very recently, uh, isolating uh, filaments from brain patients and putting that you know, after expression, purification, et cetera, putting that into a cryo and grid and do some single particle analysis. So we were able to obtain, you know, very important information with that technique. 
In the middle, of course, better therapies against Ebola. You know, Ebola is one of the deadliest viruses in the world right now. So working in collaboration with La Jolla, specifically with Professor Erika Orman Safaya, you can obtain, again, new antibodies like can target these viruses using cryo EM, mostly single particle analysis and some tomography as well. And again, uh, working with Stanford, you know, we were able to obtain the 3D reconstruction of this kinase like it's a very difficult target because it's quite small for single particle standards and it's a membrane protein. And again, using cryo and single particle analysis, we were able to solve the structure, have all the structural information we needed to be able to develop new therapies against this specific cancer. So those are only some examples, uh, like quite recent, to highlight the importance of cryo EM for single particle and tomography in you know, the health discovery uh, arena. What are the main techniques in cryo -EM? So there are three main techniques in cryo -EM. The first one uh, is a single particle analysis. This is very cool. Uh, you need to express and purify your protein of interest. Okay, so it's a still ex situ technique because you are expressing and purifying the protein. You are putting that into a cryo -EM grid, and I will explain later how to do that. And you start collecting data. And using different softwares, you are able to obtain 2D classes, so 2D projections of your particle of interest, and uh, extracting all the information from those 2D projections to get the 3D reconstruction at the end. So this is a very good technique if you are working, again, with isolated proteins and you really want to reach near atomic or atomic resolution right now. The problem, I don't want to say the problem, I will say the disadvantage of this technique it's like it's still ex situ, you know? What happened with the same protein in the context of the cell, in the context of the tissue? So that's where cryotomography comes very handy because you can really analyze those proteins of interest in the cell and in the tissue, directly there. So it's very cool because you can understand the sociology of that protein, you know, how that protein is interacting with other proteins in the context of the cell. So it's all in situ. And again, I will explain how to, to work and how to prepare the samples for tomography. And the last one is microelectron diffraction. Like, uh, you know, was developed uh, a few years ago, maybe I think it was 2013, mostly. Uh, Tamir Gonan started to, okay, let's take advantage of electron diffraction. You know, how we can combine this in the microscope with some crystallography. So micro -ED is a mix in between crystallography and uh, microscopy, electron microscopy. Why? Because we still need to have very small crystals. We are talking about 200 to 700 nanometers in size. So they are very, very small. Like you cannot use for regular crystallography because they are too tiny, but you can use them for microelectron diffraction. So once you have your crystals there, this can be for small compounds, this can be for proteins as well. You put that, you beautify those crystals in a cryo -EM grid. And after that, you go to the microscope, transmission electron microscope, and you you know, localize the crystal and start collecting data under the fractional mode in that crystal. So it's a very nice technique because uh, it's like having a synchrotron in house because you already have a transmission electron microscope here. So it's very fast and it's very, very convenient. And you can get atomic resolutions, the same resolutions that you get with regular crystallography. So where we place all these three techniques, so you can see cryotomography is mostly for objects like they are bigger and the resolutions are right now in between three to 10 astron, you know, depending on your sample. Obviously, you have the cryo -EM single particle analysis like this, a bit overlapping with both, you know, you are still working with kind of a middle size objects. They are protein or macromolecular complexes. They are ex to techniques. And the resolutions right now, again, depending on your sample, but can go in between 1.2, 1.5, until 4 astrons, you know, on a regular basis. And after we have the micro electron diffraction, again, overlapping a tiny bit with cryo and single particle analysis, uh, but the resolutions are much, much higher. So, you know, they are atomic resolutions usually. So, depending on your project, you will choose single particle, or you will choose micro electron diffraction, or you will choose tomography, or you can even do all the three. You know, that's the beauty of this. You know, you can combine all the three techniques. Yes. No, no crystal at all. Yeah, only the protein. Mm -hmm. So I will start, uh, you know, I know 
some people in the audience are interested in microelectron diffraction, so I will spend some time here. So this is only to give you an idea about all the different you know, papers we have starting even before you know, 2013. So you have 2013, 14, 15, all those years. So you can see in 2018, we have an explosion, probably because after the Nobel Prize, you know, everyone was like, oh, let's try cry again, let's try single particle, let's try micro EV, so they want to try everything. So it's a technique like it's not new, but it's rapidly increasing, and more people are using it, mostly for small compounds or uh, small drugs, natural compounds, uh, but other people as well are using it for proteins. Uh, the difficulty is still is that you need to have some crystals. Okay, so some small compounds, small molecules are very easy to crystallize, so that's good. Some proteins can be a bit more challenging to crystallize, so you know maybe it's better to go for single particle analysis first. But if you already have some crystals, like they are not good enough to go to crystallography of that specific protein, you can always make those crystals small, you know, with a fit meeting or some other techniques to do micro EV. So don't put those crystals in the trap because they can still be very useful for microelectron diffraction. And it's a technique like plenty of people are using right now. So how it works, what is the pipeline for micro EV? So the first thing, you need to have crystals, again, small crystals in between 200 to 700 nanometers. Sometimes if you have a big crystal, like again, it's one micron, it's too big for micro EV, but it's not big enough for crystallography because usually it's by microns, you know, the crystals we use for crystallography. So uh, the, the method like plenty of people are using is a cryofit meaning. So it's a focus ion beam, like we'll be making those crystals smaller under cryo condition, okay? So once you have those crystals, you know, a, a soup or a small crystal, okay, in a buffer, you will beatify those crystals in a cryo and grid, the very similar way as you are doing with single particle analysis. So those are the image you can see here in the left. So you have your crystals. And after you go to the transmission electron microscope, this can be any microscope, okay? As long as it's a transmission electron microscope, doesn't matter the voltage you are using, because it's all under the fraction mode, okay? So you go to the transmission electron microscope, blow those, you localize the crystal of interest you want to collect data on, you do a TN diffraction screening to see if you have some spots, like it diffracting, and after you start collecting, and this is a video, hopefully it's working, you start collecting diffraction till series data collection. So it's a continuous till series in that specific crystal, okay? One crystal takes about, three to five minutes to collect all the data we want, okay? Depending on the sample, but on, on average, in between five to 10 crystals on the same sample is enough data to put everything together and to do all the phasing refining using the same software like crystallographers are using for decades, and you will get the 3D reconstruction at the end, okay? So it's a very fast technique because again, it's only three minutes per crystal and you only probably need on average about 10 crystals. So it can be very, very quickly to get all the information you need to get the 3D reconstruction at the end. So what is the advantages if you compare micro ED versus you know, the typical crystallography versus uh, the x -Fel? okay? So first of all, for crystallography, you know, the, uh, usually you need large crystals, as I said before, around you know, five to 10 microns. And uh, in this particular example, for example, if we are talking about the granuline, you will need 21 crystals, big crystals, to be able to get 1.7 angstrom. And you need to have time in the synchrotron. You know, sometimes some people, is, they have already a contract with some synchrotrons and they can go there on regular basis. Some people, it's more difficult to get access, so that can be another difficulty. The x uh, you uh, can be quite expensive, can be access restricted. So it's not that easy to access. You can use small crystals as well with x -Fan. The only problem is like you need a lot of crystals. You can see here for the same protein, the granuline, we need over 80K crystals, very, very small ones to be able to get a transform resolution. So, you know, it's not very convenient. The beauty of micro ED is like, again, you can use your in-house microscope, the TEM, so you don't need to go to any synchrotron. You have everything you need in-house. And you can get very high resolutions. It's very fast method. As I say, three, five minutes per crystals on average, 
same crystals needed. You can use small crystals and need a very few crystals. So again, it's the perfect combination in between cryo -EN and crystallography. Here I have some examples of some of the you know, proteins that are already crystals, but microelectron diffraction analysis. And as I said before, it's a very fast atomic resolution, 3D structural information. You have instant productivity because again, everything is in-house. You have a complete solution, you know, including the hardware, the software, et cetera. Everything is support by the same vendor, the same people, the same microscopes you are using. And again, you can use the same system for things differently. So this is the granuline I was talking about. So it's a very small protein, it's only 29 kilodalton. So it's impossible to do by single particle analysis because the smallest we can visualize right now is around 50, so 50 kilodalton, the, the size of a star. So 29 is impossible to do by single particle analysis. So micro -ED is a very good you know, compromise. So you can see the differences in between crystallography, its spell, and micro -ED. So again, the best resolution is a still crystallography, but you need around 21 crystals, uh, five microns. So sometimes it's not easy to get that. You know, uh, the x -fel, again, you can use very small crystals, but you need plenty of those small crystals. And, you know, the micro -ED is a very, very good compromise, even if the resolution is the worst in between all the three techniques, because you can only use five crystals, very small, and get a 2.8 Armstrong resolution. So I think it's a very good balance, you know. Yeah, of course. Sometimes, yes, sometimes no. It's depending on your sample you are working with. So I will recommend to go for, uh, if you have the crystals, you know, call it as much as you can there, because again, it's so fast. It's only three to five minutes per crystal. So you already have plenty of those crystals that they are good on your sample. You can call it as many as you want and try to see the resolution increase. You know, sometimes you will see an improvement in the resolution. But uh, I, I'm not confident that you will get um, the same resolution as the crystallography, you know, because it's a different method. So, but it's a good point. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the limit and yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. So, I'm going right now with single particle analysis. As I say, it's a very nice technique when you want to study proteins and micromolecular complexes. So this is going to your question before. One of the advantages, as you can see there, is you don't need any crystal. So you express the protein of interest or micromolecular complex, you purify that, and you put that in the grid, you are done, you know. This is easy. I will explain the pipeline. You know, uh, sometimes some projects are very straightforward. Some other projects are not. So you need to be back and forth, you know, with some testing. But you don't need any crystals. And you need very small amounts of protein. So usually in one grid, we use in between three to four microliters. And depending on the protein, depending on the size of the protein, et cetera, the, the, the concentration can change. But usually it's in between for cryo and experiments, I will say probably one to maximum five to probably 10 milligram per ml. But it's only three microliters per grid. And again, depending on your sample, you will need to increase the concentration or reduce the concentration. But that is a, a good average to start with. So it's much less material, like when you are trying to crystallize the protein, like you need sometimes tons of material, you know. So the beauty as well of single particle analysis, as you can see here in the image, is that you can capture in the same experiment different conformations of the same protein. So that's very, very cool. Like it's almost impossible to do with crystallography. So it's quite dynamic, uh, you know, approach because in here you can see the ATP synthase, you know, we were able to capture all these movements, all those seven different conformations in one experiment. So that's super cool. And this can be done all computationally. So once you collect the data, you can separate those conformations computationally and obtain different 3D reconstructions. So it's very, very cool. So this is usually the pipeline you will be using, you know, for single particle analysis. Again, expression, purification of your protein of interest, micromolecular complex. After uh, you will get, for example, preparation, vitrification, uh, data collection in the TEM, and 3D reconstructions, different using different softwares. So this is a video. Let me see hopefully that works to show you a tiny bit, you know, how it works the process. 
So all those tiny things moving around are your protein of interest. So once the protein of interest again is expressed and purified, you will beautify that in your cryo and Greek a minus uh, 180 degrees Celsius. That's the typical Greek. It's a copper Greek, three millimeters in diameter. So it's quite small. You will transfer that Greek into your transmission electron microscope and you will start collecting data. So those are a typical image you will get from cryo EM single particle analysis. So you collect as many uh, images as you can. And the beauty of this is like you can pick individual particles, you know, and uh, computationally again, align those particles like they're in the same orientation. So for example, the ones like they are pot views, all aligned together, bottom views, all aligned together in between orientations, you know? So to create the 2D projections or 2D clusters, okay? So the more orientations, the more different orientations of your particle you have, the better for you, because your 3D volume, your 3D reconstruction at the end will be much more accurate because you will have information about all the angles of your protein, okay? Again, as I say, you can reach very high resolutions with this technique, but it's still exciting, you know? So you still need to express and purify the protein of interest. So this is the typical workflow. And again, I put, you know, arrows back and forth because sometimes it's very straightforward and you are lucky. But, uh, you know, I can see you say, uh -huh, yeah, I know that. Sometimes you need to be back and forth. So the first thing is, you know, expression and purification of your protein, biochemistry, the partner. And that's still very, very key, you know. Even if you have a very impressive microscope or camera or software, if your protein to start with is not good, you have aggregation, you have heterogeneity, et cetera, that is gonna be very difficult for you to resolve during the other steps, okay? So the better the sample you can get, the more homogeneous, the more clean, the more, et cetera, no aggregation, that's the best for you because it's gonna be much easier during the, the pipeline, you know, to get a very high resolution reconstruction at the end. So once you have your protein of interest, you will do a, a negative stain uh, screening. Some people in the field, they are like, oh, Natalia, we don't need negative stain anymore. Whatever, we go directly to cryo. Okay, it's good. Some people are doing that. You can go from the you know, purification step to cryo directly. But I, I am still old school. I won't recommend to do that. This is my two cents. Uh, I think the negative stain screening there is very inexpensive. It's very easy to do. And you have a very high contrast. So you can visualize all those little, little dots that are white, they are your protein. You can visualize that very quickly. And if you can already see in that negative state, like your protein is aggregating, like it's falling apart, like it's heterogeneous, you are not wasting any time to go to cryo. You know that you need to go back to the biochemistry department to change some parameters there to, you know, to do better. Uh, sometimes, even if you have a very good negative staining, that doesn't guarantee you, unfortunately, that you will have a very good cryo EM sample. You know, sometimes it's not the case because in the cryo EM, you have the air water interface, like plenty of physics going on in there. And I probably, I don't know what is going on in there, to be honest with you. And I don't, don't know, probably Dave knows much better than myself, but it's craziness. All the things that are going on in that air water interface. So some proteins are very happy negative stain, but going to cryo, where you don't have any artifacts, you don't have any staining, like you're an informator, you're an acetate, so you are losing contrast, but you have the resolution you need because you don't have any artifacts. Some proteins, they don't like it. They are, they are aggregating, et cetera. So again, you need to be back and forth, testing different parameters, et cetera. So let's say you are happy and you are lucky, and everything goes well. So you have a perfect sample, perfect negative stain screening, perfect cryo EM sample. So you can already go to the microscope, start collecting data. Usually I recommend to collect a preliminary data set, like it's probably 200, 300 images. And you can already create some 2D projections or 2D classes to understand if your protein has preferred orientation or things like that. What that means, preferred orientation, like all your proteins are, for example, in dot views. So that's not good. Okay, so that means you need to be back again, you know, and that means that you don't want to waste time collecting for two days in the microscope 
if you have the preferred orientation problem. So a preliminary data set is always a very good idea because you will be able to already understand what is going on with your protein. It's impossible to see or almost impossible to see preferred orientation in the raw image. Okay, sometimes you can see it, but sometimes you cannot. So again, preliminary data set. And when everything is working well, you know, you are the perfect sample, you can go to the microscope, start collecting data for one or two days and get to the very high resolution 3D volume at the end. But again, this can be very smooth or this can be back and forth every single time. And you can spend weeks, months trying to figure it out, okay? So can be tricky, but don't panic. It's doable, okay? I promise you. So some examples, yeah. So what you mean by being fast? So one is isolated protein in general, or uh, a protein inhibited by the ligand? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, when I talk about protein, I you can... Know, let's say, like, uh, I use the DNA virus. Yes. So I use, like, uh, DNA virus, the DNA, so can DNA, and the inhibitor. So yeah, so like, all that you can do it. You can do the complex. Yes. So you can have your protein of interest. You can bind any drug, a small compound. You can buy DNA. You can buy another protein of interest and do micromolecular complexes. All that can be done with the same, the same technique. Yes. So some examples of what you are looking for and what you are not looking for. So the first one, this is negative staining. Okay. So this is when you purify your complex of interest or protein of interest, you put that in the grid. You add uranium formate or uranium acetate, usually, you know, it's a, it's a heavy metal to increase the contrast, you know. So that's the reason you can see very well your proteins. All those tiny white blots are proteins, okay? But you don't have the contrast in negative. If you have the contrast, sorry, you don't have the resolution because, again, you have the artifacts. You, you, you have all the staining around the protein. So that's increasing the contrast, but decreasing the resolution, okay? So, Again, very nice to see what is going on with your protein. The first example is too concentrated. So I don't like it. You cannot do anything with that. In the middle, you can see it's very heterogeneous. So you have everything there. So you don't want to work with that either. So that in the in the right side is the best test scenario where you have a protein like it's homogeneous, you have a particle distribution like it's very good. So you can still pick up all those individual particles because they are not overlapping with each other, so that's perfect. So that kind of sample can go to cryo right now and see what happens, okay? So this is the machine we usually you know, use or recommend to use for cryo. So uh, it's a chamber where you can control you know, the temperature, you can control the humidity, etc. So you can see in the middle image, uh, you have two um, you know, white filter papers. So you will be uh, putting the sample in your cryo EN grid, there and uh, you will, you know, with a pipette and after you will wait for 10 to 15 seconds and after you will be blotting, you know, away the excess of liquid. You know, you want to have a very thin layer of buffer surrounding your protein of interest, but not too thick because if it's too thick, you will be losing contact uh, in the microscope, okay? So those white papers there are, are the ones that they will be blotting away the excess of buffer of solution. And after that, you will be plunging directly your sample into that ethan cup. So that's a liquid ethan, like as a minus 180 degrees Celsius. So once the sample is vitrified, it's so fast that like you don't have any crystalline ice. If you have crystalline ice, it's because you have some ice contamination, that's not good. And always happen to have some ice contamination is impossible to avoid, but because it's a very fast process, you are vitrifying your sample, you don't have any uh, you know, crystalline ice. So once the sample is vitrified, every single thing you are doing with that specific grid needs to be under liquid nitrogen condition. So everything needs to be cold in down. The microscope, the tweezers that you will be using to, to take the grid, everything, okay? So some examples of cryo -EN screening. So you have your sample, it's vitrified. So what are you looking for, okay? So as I said before, the grid is a three millimeter copper grid. Usually it can be gold grid, can be other substrates, but usually, you know, people use the copper ones. It's a small one. And inside the grid, you have squares. And inside the squares, you have this, those holes, okay? And inside the hole is where you are taking the image. So you can see here in the bottom one, uh, left, we have different examples of things going on. 
So for example, uh, you have the first one, you have the protein going into the hole, but in the edge of the hole. So that's not good. The second one is okay, it's good. You have some proteins in the holes. It's, the concentration is a bit too low, but it's all fine. The third one is good, it's perfect. And the other ones in the bottom is no good because the concentration in the first one is too low and the other guy, the proteins are not going into the holes. So those are the typical problems that you can get. And the ones you are looking for, let me put some pointer here because otherwise it's gonna be difficult to tell you. The ones that you are looking for is this guy and this guy, okay? So where you have a nice distribution, this is a nice example of particles in the middle of your hole, okay? Once you find that, you can start doing data collection. So what are the common issues you can find with cryo -ER single particles? So first of all, no protein in the holes, as I said before. So the possible solutions you can apply. So you can increase the concentration of your protein, of your sample, to try to push those proteins into the holes. You can super saturate the carbon. So how do you do that? You know, usually I explain you, you add three microliters of your sample, you wait for 10 seconds, you blot, and you plunge, okay? That's the, usually the way you do it. If you are having that problem, you can do another three microliters. So you apply three microliters, you wait, you blot, you don't plunge, you apply another three microliters of your same sample, you blot again, and you plunge. So you are trying to saturate the carbon, like the protein, we don't have any choice but going into the holes. It's like going in the Rosawa metro in Osudway in New York, okay? If you push the people, you know, at some point, you know, they, they will go in and they will make it happen. It's just an idea. You know, you saturate as much as you can to make that protein going into the holes. Uh, other things, protein aggregating, typical problem as well on cryo -ER. So you can decrease the concentration in the case it's the opposite. You can add some detergents or change the buffer conducing. That can help as well with aggregation. Prefer orientation, another typical problem in cryo -ER. So you can change the specimen support. So you can change the grid type you are using. I tell you the, the majority are using you know, copper grids, but you can use graphene, you can use gold grids, other substrates to avoid that preferred orientation. And that sometimes helps. Uh, you can, you know, don't glow discharge, and I didn't really specify this, uh, but before going and applying the sample into your grid, you need to do a glow discharge or plasma cleaning First of all, to clean the grid and do other things. But sometimes, if you don't do that, you know, you can avoid preferred orientation. Don't ask me why. I have no idea. But I try it myself, and that work. Uh, another thing, you can do a collect killed data set. So usually for single particle analysis, when you go to the microscope, you don't kill the stage. You only call it at zero degrees because it's all the high resolution information is coming from that. But if you have a very high preferred orientation, you can kill to 20, 25 degrees to, to try to have extra orientations of your particles, okay? And of course, you can come back to the biochemistry department and do biochemical modifications, but that is the last step, you know, if you need to go back to the expression and purification of your protein, okay? So some examples of, I know some people here are working with liposomes, nanoparticles, et cetera. So you can visualize all those things in the transmission electron microscope. These are some examples using 100 kb uh, system. So you can see already the difference in the shapes of the liposomes. You can already see the B layers. You can already quantify and, and even measure the diameter of those liposomes. So it's very, very good. Uh, otherwise, this is again liposomes. Like they are uh, vitrified as well, cryo -ER, uh, visualized at 200 kb. So you can already see the quality of the images. So all this can be done, you know, the nanoparticles, liposomes can be done uh, by cryo-EM. Uh, another thing like I want to spend a bit more time right now is like how to do very quickly, you know, all the data processing. So, okay, you have the best sample, you were able to be very lucky to avoid all those problems, to have the perfect cryo-EM grid, you collect your data in a transmission electron microscope, Usually, you know, 1,000, 2,000 images, depending on your sample. And after that, you need to analyze all that. So the first thing is like all computationally done. So as I said before, you have all those particles, like they are randomly oriented in your grid. So you will be able to pick up all those particles. 
generate, oh, sorry about that. Oh, come back. So generate all those images. Ow. Yeah. So generate all those images there, you know, as I said, the 2D projections regarding, you know, bottom views, side views in between. So you put them all together to generate the 2D classes or 2D projections, the 2D views of your profile of interest. And after you will use all those 2D projections to extract all the information you need to create a 3D body in the end. So the main software right now that we are using for single particle analysis is like Relayon and Cryospar. But, you know, you have others around, but those are the main ones right now. So again, once the data is collected, all the data processing is all computational. And you have plenty of tutorials, plenty of trainings, like they are very, very well done. So it's very, this is the easy part, you know, it's very easy to, to, to proceed with all this. Again, you will need, because we are talking about collecting plenty of images, cryo and images, like they are quite big, you know, depending on the system. So you will need to think about computational needs as well, you know. So again, it's important to transfer all the data to a cluster where you can do all the data processing, etc. You can even uh, think about archiving or storage as well, like it's separate from the cluster you are using for data processing. So all that needs to be think up, okay? And sometimes some people like that are starting a new facility, cryo -EM, they don't realize how massive amount of data is coming their way. I can be quite overwhelming. So it's something please to keep in your mind. Some examples I want to show you right now uh, for single particle analysis. This is uh, coming from a 100 kV microscope. You can see uh, this is a 330 kilodalton membrane protein at 4.2 astrons. You have the GABA receptor, another membrane protein at 3.4. You have the proteosome at 3 astrons. You have the ribosome at 3.5, the AAB6 virus at 3.5, and the apoferritin at 2.6. So apoferritin is the test control sample for single particle analysis. We use it, if you want to test how, how good a system is, you will use always apoferritin. Okay, why? Uh, because it's a very robust sample. It's not flexible. It's quite big, it's 500 kilodalton and you have synergy. So all those things are ideal or optimal, I will say, for single particle analysis. So that's the reason we use it all the time as a control sample. So examples, again, of kind of resolutions you can get when you're working with the 200 kV microscope. Again, when you increase the voltage, you know, uh, the resolution is going to be higher. All this is in theory. Again, depending on your sample, you know, but uh, when you are working with a 100 kV versus 200 versus 300 kV, if you really want to pursue the best resolution, you will be using the 300 kV instrument versus the 100 or the 200, okay? Uh, for example, 200 kV, you have the proteosome at 2.1, you have the apoferritin at 1.6, so you can already see the differences, you know, 2.6 at 100 kV, 1.6 at 200 kV, and it's 1.2 at 300 kV. So, you know, Again, no every single sample will be that difference in resolutions depending on your sample, but it's only to keep in your mind. Uh, the GABA receptor at 2.4, the GPCR, like it's a quite complicated membrane protein, you know, to do by crystallography at 2.6, and very small proteins, you know, like the cycling and even the human hemoglobin, only 64 kilodalton at 2.5 and 3.4. And obviously, you know, the best of the best is the 300 kV, you know, microscopes where you can get 1.7 astrons for the GABA receptor, and you can, this is going to your question, you can get a, a very small molecule bound to the GABA receptor, in this case, it's a, a sopiclon drug, so you can see that, how this uh, drug is binding to the protein, and you can get a 1.9 astron resolution. So it's very good if you want to map epitopes, if you want to see how these drugs are binding, this is perfect. So the hemoglobin at two astrons and, uh, you know, the SARS-CoV-2, 62 kilodalton membrane protein at 2.1, and the streptavidin, like it's only 52 kilodalton. I told you before, like the smallest protein you can visualize by single particle is around 50 kilodalton. So this is 52, and we can get a 1.7. So it's very impressive. If you don't have any questions regarding single particle, I will go quite quickly to our cryotomography. So cryotomography is a bit more different, you know, how you prepare your sample. So we are working mostly with cells or tissues. 
So in this particular example, I will focus on cells, you know? So you grow out the cells directly into your grid, okay? So the, 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 the cells are growing happily, hopefully, in your grid, okay? Once that is happening, you need to vitrify those, those cells the same way you vitrify the single particle analysis. You know, the proteins is the same machine you are using. So once they are vitrified, you can, you know, do some correlated microscopy. So because the cells are very crowded, okay? So you really need to target the protein of interest in the cell with a fluorophore or some other targeting. So you do that. And after that, because the cells are very big, if you go directly from there to the transmission electron microscope, you won't be able to see anything. It's gonna be a black, massive mass, okay? So the first thing you need to do, another extra step, is the thing that we call the FIP cell. It's a focus ion beam that will be able to mill away the parts of the cell that you don't care about, create very thin lamella, around 200 nanometers, like you will be able to transfer into the transmission electron microscope to collect data on those lamella. Okay, so that's an extra step that you need to think about when you are working with tomography. And after, of course, collect the data and do the data analysis. So this is a tiny video. Let me see if I can remove this. I can show you the video. In this particular video, is we're working with viruses because for viruses, because they are quite random and heterogeneous, you cannot use a single particle. You only you can do that only by tomography. But viruses doesn't need to go for cryofit cells because they are still thin enough. So you put the virus in your cryo and grid, you go to a transmission electron microscope and you start collecting data. So one of the main differences in between the way you collect data for single particle and the way you collect data for tomography is the tilting. Okay, for single particle, as I said before, you don't tilt. Usually you don't tilt. For tomography, you need to tilt. And you are creating a tilt series, usually from minus 70 to plus 70 degrees. So you are doing increments the two to three degrees every single time to create the thing that we call the tomogram, like it's kind of a movie, okay? So you put all those tilt series together to create the tomogram, okay? And after you do all the tomogram, subtomogram analysis to get the 3D volume of your viruses in this particular example, okay? But you can do the same with the sets. So, Tomography can be done in very different kind of samples. So for example, you can do that in viruses or bacteria, usually bacteria and viruses because they are less in general than 300 nanometers in thickness. You can vitrify them directly in the grid and go directly to the transmission electron microscope, okay? When you are working with cells, when you are working with tissues because they are very thick, you will need to add the extra cryo fit cell step where you need to mill away those areas that you don't care, open windows into the cell or open windows into the tissue to be able to create those lamella and go to the transmission electron microscope. So for cells and tissues, you will need to have the cryofit and specifically for tissues, because they are too thick, you, you need to do the high pressure freezing technique, you know, with those planchettes and you will need to probably, you know, do the cryo lift out where you literally take a chunk of that tissue, and after you create the lamella directly in the same machine, in the cryofit cell, okay? So it's a bit more complicated working with tissues, but again, the first step working with tomography will be for you viruses, that's very easy, or bacteria, and after you can keep moving with cells, where you will be doing the cryofit, and after the last step, the more complicated one will be the tissues, okay? So let me show you in this video how this works. So those are your cells, like they are growing into your, your cryo and grid, okay? So you take that specific grid where the cells are growing happily, you know, hopefully, that can be a bit tricky as well, depending on the cells you are working with. So you go to the machine here and you do the vitrification process. So, you know, it's the same thing I explained before for single particle analysis, you will be blotting with those filter papers to create a very thin layer of buffer or solution around your cells, okay? So once that is done, you will be plunging that into the ethan cup, and after those cells are vitrified, you can take them to the cryofit to be able to mill and open those windows into your cells. 
So the thing I will show you right now, this is the typical, you know, uh, cryo fit. So, and I can show you here how it works. So you have the E uh, column, so the SEM, the scanning electron microscope for imaging. Uh, that is in green and in red is the ion beam, so the ions. This is the cell, like it's in your grid and it's liquefied. So automatically you will be able to select the areas that you want to meet. Those are the areas in yellow. And in between, you have the lamella, okay? So you will be meaning away all those areas in the cell that you don't care about under cryo conditions, and you will be generating that very thin lamella around 200 nanometers on average. And after that, you will take that lamella and you will put it in the transmission electron microscope to collect data on that. This is a typical thing. This is a, you know, in chlamydomonas, you can see in the middle is the typical cell growing in your, in your grid. And after that's a typical lamella like you generate. So you can already see the very high contrast. You can already see even in the lamella, visualize all the different organelles. So it's very cool. And if you take that obviously into a cryo transmission electron microscope at 200 kV, you can get some very good data. You know, the majority of the people, they use 300 kV for tomography, you know, because it's better resolution and it's, it's better, you know, in general, but some, some people, they have already only 200 kV system. And they were wondering, can I use a 200 kV microscope for tomography? Yes, they can. The resolution usually will be not as high as with the 300 kV microscope, but you can do it. So this is a proof of concept. We collect apopharitin in a 200 kV microscope, and you can see after you know 41 uh, tomograms, you can get around 4.8 4 astron resolution. So again, no bad. Another example here I want to show you. This is um, a bacterial cell. So because the thickness is around 300 nanometers, you don't need to go to the cryofit. You can you know, put directly the bacteria into your cryo EM grid and go to the transmission electron microscope. And you can see in the left side, those are the tomograms who we are collecting. And on the right side, after doing all the tomogram, subtomogram uh, averaging and doing all the segmentation work uh, using specific softwares, you know, you can get all this beautiful 3D reconstruction of your bacteria. Set. So it's very, very cool. Another example I want to show you as well for 200 uh, kV, so 200 kV microscope. This is a lamella for chlamydomonas that we prepare in the cryofib. You can get this 200 nanometers in thickness. So you can see here in the left, the lamella. And uh, when you transfer that into the microscope, again, you collect all the tomography data with all the field series. You do the tomogram, subtomogram averaging and the segmentation work, and you can already see all these beautiful organelles, so, you know, the ER, the Golgi, the ribosomes in yellow, so it's very, very pretty. So all that can be visualized in situ. So it's very cool because if you are interested in working, okay, by single particle analysis, you can get a very high resolution of your micromolecular complex of interest, but you can even visualize the same protein in the context of the cell, and you can compare both, and I think it's very, very cool. So more examples, you know, obviously the majority of the people are using 300 kV instruments for tomography. Some examples of this, uh, this is a HIV virus. Uh, and you can see a 300 kV with only 13 tomograms. You can already get a 4.2 astron resolution. And it's the first time like you can visualize this pocket, this drugable pocket, fully, fully resolved. You know, so it's very, very exciting because again, this, Structural information can help to develop you know, new therapies against HIV. Another example here is the GAJ, the virus like particles. Again, 300 kV uh, system with only eight tomograms. It's about five hours of data collection, so it's quite fast. You can get a 3.8 astron resolution as well. So, super impressive, you know. When I started doing tomography almost 10 years ago, if you get by cryotomo 15 astrons, you were like, oh my God, let's open the champagne bottle party time because you were so happy. Right now, look at the resolutions. We can get almost, almost very, very good resolutions. Of course, no atomic yet. Yet, we say yet, because probably with the technology evolving so fast, it's going to happen very time, very, very, very soon. More examples here I want to show you. Those are, uh, you know, Again, you can see the cells in the top left in the, in, the, in the grid. You can see the lamella in the middle. 
and you can see the tomograms like we collected, all the we did all the tomograms with tomogram averaging. You can see that in the bottom image where you can see already the nuclear core, the mitochondria, the nuclear envelope. So when you do all the work here, you can even you know, isolate ribosomes in situ and do all the three reconstruction of those ribosomes in situ, and you can get a polarized resolution from those ribosomes. So it's very, very interesting. Or you can, you know, visualize whatever part of the of the cells you are you are looking or you are focusing on. Uh, I think that's the last example I want to show you. Uh, this is again cryotomography coming for a 300 kV. You can see the high contrast. You can already visualize on the tomograms in the left side. And when you do all the segmentation work, you can already see the different organelles and all those beautiful ribosomes in blue. So it's very, very pretty. This is all the work that we call the second resolution revolution because the first resolution revolution happened you know, with single particle analysis. In 2020, finally, we got the first real atomic resolution at 1.2 astrons with apoperitin. You know, more and more people are uh, going from single particle tomography right now as well because they are like, okay, it's very cool to have very high resolutions, but what happened with the same protein in the context of the tissue or the cell? I want to visualize in situ right now. So it's happening. So all this work I saw you is coming from these collaborations, you know, in Europe, in Asia, and in the US. So we are very excited about the evolution of tomography. This is the common, and this is my last slide, this is the common misperception about cryo EL for new people. You know, oh, it's new technique. Uh, I don't want to try it. Or it's a complex technique. Oh my God, I won't be able to learn this. Or very, very expensive. Oh, no, 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 this, I cannot do it. Difficult to access or very difficult to use. I hope like you know, you have CMAS here, you have perfect, very, very high level experts working there. They will be able to help you all the way through all the pipeline you decide to use, micro ED, single particle tomography. A again, we are as well here to help you as well if you need anything. But I hope after my presentation today, all those misconceptions are gone on your brain. Is this is still not that cheap, but it's much more affordable, like probably 10 years ago. It's not that difficult to use because, again, we have plenty of automatic softwares that you can really uh, learn very quickly. We have even artificial intelligence in some microscopes, like, can do everything for you, you know, almost everything for you. Even my kids can run it right now, to be honest with you. So, again, it's much more affordable, and uh, even for the new people to start doing cryo again. So thank you again for all your attention today. And this is my email address, so natalia.tribalthermofeature.com. If you need anything, because I know it's plenty of, of information in one hour, and probably your brain is exploding right now. But if you have any questions right now, please go ahead and ask me. But if you think about anything else later on, you can reach out uh, by email. So thank you again. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've been going to a specific cases about cameras or energy filter because, you know, for timing purposes, it was too long otherwise. But yeah, you need the energy filter. So the energy filter is a you need it. It's very good to have it for single particle, but it's key and essential for tomography. Yeah. Yeah, because our blade like, does not have an energy filter, and we've talked about trying tomography at uh, 200 kV, but our concern is that the contrast. The contrast, yeah. And I was doing tomography when I was in NCI, uh, and Giovanna knows this. Uh, in the CRIOS we have, uh, we have a K2 camera and a Falcon 3 camera, and uh, we don't have any energy filter, and I was doing tomography on viruses. So that was still okay, because even without the energy filter, uh, because it's a 300 kV, you still have some contrast. You know, and their viruses are a bit more easy than the lamella. But uh, with the 200 kV microscope, I will say try it. You never know. But I will be very surprised if the contrast is, is very good. You know, you probably need to, at some point, to add an energy filter if you are planning to do plenty of tomography in that microscope. Yeah. Couple yeah. questions about micro -ED. Um, Yeah. <clears throat> is there still the phase problem? <laughs> oh uh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So there's no way that those you can figure out. Okay. 
Um, no, that's the same like with crystallography. Yeah, it's a right, right, problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then in, um, you had an upper limit on your, I liked your plot where you had KD versus uh, resolution. Because so resolution, yeah. yeah. But um, my grading had a, a max of 200. Let me back, let me go back now, there. Is that One second. Because, um, I can try to find that, present that thing very quickly. I think that's the one you are talking about, huh? Yeah. Okay. I mean, is that because if your sample's too big, you don't have enough unit cells if you get a thin enough crystal? Or is that just because at that point you should be doing single particle? Or oh, the, is the, really the limitation for the size? The limitation for the size of the. Right, it's 280. Yes. Uh, because usually, you know, um, when you are working with, you, usually my credit is applied right now for the small compounds because they are very easy to crystallize in general. When you are going for samples that they are bigger than that, they are usually proteins or micromolecular complexes, but you still need crystals. Okay. So you know what I mean? It's going to be sometimes challenging to get crystals of those. So that's the limitation inside there. Okay. I was thinking that maybe, I mean, if you have a bigger molecule, you have a bigger unit cell. That, that too. And then your that crystal too. has to be bigger that too. to get enough unit cells. That too, yeah. Um, so, I mean, do you know how many unit cells a typical crystal would have? Oh, that's a good question. I um, don't know. For my because they're very small. Yeah. Okay. They are in between, usually in between 300 to 700 nanometers. Oh, that's a good question. I, I don't know. And I can I can follow up with, with okay. that, you okay. know, because it's Thanks. a very good question. And I don't know how many units do, do you have in those small, very, very small crystals. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me like micro AD is slowly. Yeah, picking up. It's more difficult, it seems to me, than these, but yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you need to have, you know, at some point, some method to mill those crystals. You know, uh, Tamir Gonen, like he's, I will say, one of the pioneers of uh, micro -ED is at UCLA, and they have a cryofit system only to mill those crystals, okay. you know, to make them perfect for micro -ED. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that cryofit milling, uh, you have other methods. When I was in NCI, I was using other methods to make those crystals smaller, but they are homemade and they are quite clicky. So, yeah. and that can be the most difficult part, having those small crystals homogeneous yeah. and put those crystals into the grid. That can be the tricky part. Once you have that, the, the collection and all the processing is easy peasy. Okay. You know, but the meaning of the crystals, having those crystals, putting those crystals in the grid, because sometimes they like to be in the filter paper. So you need to probably, you know, when you apply, you have that's the grid and you have the three microliters here. Mm -hmm. you, feel, you, you blot like that. But if you do that with the crystals, the majority of the crystals are going to the filter paper. Okay. So surprise, you go to the microscope, where are my crystals? Uh -huh, in the filter paper. So you need to blow from behind. You know, like you put those right. crystals ah, right, into right, the grid. Right. Okay. So there, you know. Tiny crystals have not been a problem for my lab. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> well, that's good then. <laughs> <laughs> let me build on that question, but I mean, I think that it's a really important point. And I think it's part of the discussion here. It's not just about, you know, in trying to be in wonderful, but way out the problem. And I think you think the nail, nail on the head. I mean, I think the value, with all due respect, you're correct in that, you know, you can make these samples, we need small crystals. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have access to instrumentation, it is a very fast process, relatively speaking, to get good data. Yeah. Getting a structure is not necessarily fast. No. And, you know, talking of someone like the Ergonin's group at UCLA, yes, they have probably lost the structure, but they've also collected a lot of data oh, yeah. that can't solve the structure. Oh, yeah. Okay. And of course, the challenge here to give the expert, or the doctor, the expert here, is that electrons interact with materials much more strongly than yes. it, and therefore the whole idea is that we're sort of trying to suppress dynamic mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so i think the answer to your question Chuck, is more to do with the wavelength of the electrons at 300 kV and how what the radius and curvature on the eval sphere is like versus the size of the crystal and how that creates dynamical scattering effects that ends up in data that you just can't solve yeah and um, and I think that within the micro ED community, it is improving, but there are still lots of data oh, yeah. that people collect yeah. and they cannot solve the structure. Yeah. Because yeah, fundamentally, the base problem has a lot of weight. Yeah, that's, a, that's a still the same thing. And yeah. so I think that you know, it's we need to be very careful, especially when we're trying to grow our community, is 
you know, let's not have, you know, look at this Google's thing to be to say we can collect this data, we'll automatically solve the structure. That is absolutely not true. Yeah, no, no, no. It no. can be done. Yeah. But the hard work is actually analyzing the data. Yeah, and that happened. I completely agree with you, Dave. Thank you for that point. And that happened with every single technique. I mean, you know, explain here, as I said before, for single particle, you know, you have the smooth path, but it's never smooth. And we are all scientists here, so we know what that takes, you know, you are back and forth, back and forth. And again, completely agree with Dave's point, you know, those techniques, depending on your sample, can be more easier, you know, again, or more complicated. So yeah, 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 totally, totally agree. Okay, so I don't see any questions popping up. Um, it's the chat box, but I did put the whole extent for those of you who are virtual um, in the chat. So we're going to take um, a brief break until about 10, 15. Um, if you Um, so the next talk will be our tomography um, user, and Giovanna will also be providing some updates on cryofib at CMAS. So you're welcome to come back um, if you're not interested in tomography. We also have a single particle example later on. Um, if you're in the room, please grab a snack, take a break, walk around, um, and we'll come back at 10.15. And for those online, if you do have questions, please just post them in the chat. Or if you'd like to ask, ask yourself, yourself, just raise your hand and just can unmute you, and, and, you and, and that can happen and just while we're we're chatting and interacting as well as uh, during the session. So please feel free to ask any questions. Okay. Um, so welcome back everyone so the next two sessions are going to consist of um, users of our facility so um, real people that have done cryo work at CMAS um, and so they're going to present um, their research results to you hopefully it's not going to be too technical we don't want it to make it um, it's not like it's for um, sort of uh, this specific research topic necessarily. We want to talk more about just cryo in general. Um, but we have with us someone from Dr. Chen Gu's lab, this is Dima. She's a graduate student in OSVP. Yep. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, so she's going to give a, a brief presentation uh, about the work that was done um, with one of our instrument managers, Vivian Day, who's in the back as well. Um, and so we're very interested to hear your story and your results. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dima from Dr. Chengu's lab. Today I'm going to present our work using the CryoET to visualize the change of the axon diameters and under the mechanical force. So an uh, axon can conducts action potential away from the nervous cell body. The function of an axon is to transfer transmit information to different neurons, glands, and muscles. Depends on the type of the neurons, the axon can greatly vary in length. Many of them are just a millimeter or so, but the longest mammalian axon can, such as that go from the brain down to the spinal cord, can be as long as a meter. And the diameter of the axon also have the very variation. Usually, most of the individual axons are about one micron or so, but uh, the largest mammalian axon can reach a diameter of up to 20 micron. The larger diameter axon have a higher conduction velocity, which means they will be able to, set, set, to send the signals faster. And axon diameters are mainly regulated by the axon cytoskeleton. There are three major components in the axon cytoskeleton, the neurofilaments, actin, and mactubules. All of them play an important role in the axon diameter regulation. Axonal diameter are usually be considered as uniform. However, under some specific conditions, axon can form the varicosities. The varicosities are the swelling or the enlargement along the axonal tubes, and it can affect axonal conduction and synaptic transmission. It is a, a key pathological feature believed to develop a slow accumulation to axonal damage that occurs during re irreversible degeneration. For example, the mild traumatic brain injury, the neurodegenerative disease such as the Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and multiple sclerosis. 
since the axonal varicosity are always associated with the irreversible neuron degeneration, their initiation was thought to be very slow and irreversible in the past. However, our result in 2017 first showed that the axonal varicosity formation induced by the mechanical stress was unexpectedly rapid and reversible. So we uh, we use the mechanical pressure was delivered by the puffing of Hanks buffer directly to the axon. And we saw that the varicosities were very quickly formed and they can half of them can recover after 20 minutes. So varicosities has always been our research of interest. Previously, we used uh, the confocal microscopy and the TEM to study the structure of the varicosities. And in this study, we used the cryo-ET to produce the high-resolution three-dimensional wheels of the samples. Like uh, Natalia just said, the cryo-ET -ET is a specialized application for the cryo-TEM, in which samples are imaged as they are tilted. So we will have a series of the 2D images that we can combine them together to produce a 3D reconstruction, which is very similar to a CT scan to human body. In contrast uh, to other electron tomography, the samples are immobilized in the non-crystalline eyes and will be imaged under the cryo conditions. This is allow us to, uh, to prepare our samples without any fixation or dehydration, so which could otherwise disturb the biological structure. And we compare the neuron culture on the grid and the glass cover sleeves. On top of the grid, the neurons are still able to differentiate and glow the long processes. At 1DIV, the neurons extend the field processes. And at 3DIV, one of the processes becomes significantly longer than others, which is the axon. At 7DIV, both the axons and dendrites even elongated. And uh, at 14 DIV, axons and dendrites form the very complicated network with synapses also start to form. However, when we take a closer look at the axons, the axon growing on the flat surface and the lacy carbon film is very different. We performed the TEM of the neurons cultured on the flat surface and observed many axons with this roughly uniform diameter. However, when we culture those neurons on the lacy carbon film coated grid for the cryo-ET, we found those enlargement varicosities when they are growing on those lacy carbon film. So at first for this study, we're trying to induce those varicosities on the lacy carbon film. But not what we found is that we don't have to induce it. Those varicosities will naturally develop when cultured on those non-uniform surface. So this is very interesting because our brain is not a flat surface at all. So we are wondered what is the neuron looks like when we when they're in vivo in the mouse brain. So here to determine the potential difference of the axonal diameter variation in the white and green matters in the brain in vivo, we perform the confocal microscopy in the corpus callosum and cortex of the 7FP transgenic mouse. The image stacks were reconstructed into 3D in order to accurately determine the diameter of axon. In corpus callosum, most of the axons run parallel to each other, and most of, of them are melanated. Our measurements show that significantly that diameter variation occur along individual axon. So even in the highly compacted axonal bundles in the white matter, the diameter along individual axon is far from uniform. Next, we examine the axons in cortex, which is the typical gray matter in the brain. And the variation ratio and the abundance of such variations are even higher in the cortex. Moreover, we found that the varicosities always formed in the holes of the lacy carbon film, and the axon shift on top of the carbon fiber were always the narrowest part of the axon, which clearly shows that the mechanical macroenvironment can shift the axon structure. With, with the support of the lacy carbon film, the diameter of axon will always reduce, and it can even squeeze the, the mitochondria inside. And here is a 3D wheel for this squeezed mitochondria.
And the best part of the Cryo ET is we can get the high resolution 3D images for the samples we look at. So we look at the varicosities developed on the carbon film. And here are some examples of the typical varicosities. Um, so the first uh, axonal varicosity example from the well contacting with other axons and the cellular structures in a hole on the lithic carbon film. It contains a total of eight uh, mactubule filaments, three large mitochondria, and a number of small vesicles. And here is the 3D structure after the segmentation. And the second example is a varicosity containing one large multivesicular body. This varicosity contains five mactubules and many small vesicles. And here is the 3D view after the segmentation. We also looked at the fasciculated axons, and we found that the bundled axons are less likely to form the large varicosities over the host. However, on the unrestricted side, on the side there is no other axons, they still form those varicosities, and those varicosities are still have these whole filling properties. And here is an example of two fasciculate axons. We can see that on the side, they're like uh, fasciculate with each other. It's relatively smooth. And the other side, they still form the var enlargement varicosity. And those varicosities are filling the holes of the lithic carbon film. After looking at 191 varicosities, we did a quantification about the diameter of the varicosities and the shift. The varicosity diameter have a lot of variation, but, of, but most of them are four to eight fold larger than the shift. We also found the diameter of the shift is highly correlated with the number of mactubules. In those 191 varicosities, approximately half of them contain at least one mitochondria, whereas 16% of them contain multivesicular body, and 5% of them contain both mitochondria and multivesicular body. Approximately 40% of them do not contain either the mitochondria or the multivesicular body, but most of them still contain small vesicles. And similar with what we found in the cryo-ET, we also found the varicosities that induced by the mild fluid puffing, as I mentioned before, also enrich with the mitochondria. So here we have a uh, axon that, uh, uh, that we transfect them with the YFP metal, which we all labeled the endogenous mitochondria. After puffing, we found that, that that the varicosities always form as a position that pre-existing those mitochondria. And those in vivo puffing result and uh, our cryo-ET result both suggest that the varicosities, no matter developed by the mechanical stress or naturally develop on the non-uniform surface, tend to form in the position that pre-existing the mitochondria and multivesicular body. So as a summary, our results found that when being cultured on the lacy carbon film of the EM grid, the axons develop the varicosities and containing mactubules and always mitochondria might have a secular bodies and small vesicles in the holes of the film, which is very similar to the varicosity that induced by the mild fluid puffing. And the axon diameter is highly correlated with the number of the mactubules in the shift region of the axon when cultured on the non-uniform macroenvironment. And take together, our results uh, have reveled several novel features of the 3D uterus structure of the distal axons in response to the non-uniform macroenvironment. And we have published this paper earlier this year on the MDPSLs. So we cannot finish this project without the results from the CARMAS. In this project, we used the state-of-art electron microscopies, included the glycils and the TCAN cross system. Those instruments allow us to study axonal varicosities in the highest resolution we have never achieved. 
providing very valuable insights into their structures and the compositions. In addition, the Karmas offers access to the powerful software such as the AMOD and the Avezo, which helped us to process and visualize the data. More importantly, the wonderful staff here provide us with the top-notch support. Before starting this project, I know very little about the Cryo EM. So I have some experience in the lab, with the lab microscope, microscope or with the confocal, but this is the first time I have ever touched the Cryo, Cryo EM. And the, the staff here at the CarMax, particular Bing Bing, helped me a lot during this project. She helped uh, us at every step. And in the experimental design phase, she provided us with the uh, advice on which grid we can use for culture neuron. And uh, during the sample preparation phase, she helped us to immobilize and store the grids. Most importantly, she's an expert in the CRAL ET and helped us to obtain high quality data during the data collection phase, followed by the supervision of the data processing and the segmentation. And in addition, she's very helpful in the facility policy and management. Many of those important data were collected during the toughest time of the COVID pandemic. And the wonderful management here in CarMath ensured that the advanced the equip equipment was used safely and efficiently. And the CarMath also provided me with the necessary training for the CRAW EM. And I've heard that uh, in addition to the hands-on training that I received very specifically for my project, CarMax also offers the general training for the beginners to sy systematically learning about the crowd TEM. And I want to thank, thank my PI to supervise me on this project and Bingbing Deng in Karmas for her help in the Crow ET, as I mentioned earlier. And my lab mate Chao Sun helped me with the confocal image. And uh, that's all I have today. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, see if this grew the culture is the neurons on the lacy carbon. Mm -hmm. Do you guys think about trying other types of substrates? Like, for example, just like a thin carbon film? I don't know if they would grow on that. That would be more like a cover slip. Yes, we did try a few can a, a different some different types of grid before we move to the lacy carbon. The problem is that some of the carbon film are too soft and they cannot hold the neuron on the grid. So when we culture the grid on the on uh on those grid, when we take the grid out, the it's like the the, the grid just the the, car, the carbon film just break. So we need a higher like support rather than the normal carbon. And we also try the the, the copper uh, like grease, but they just kill the neurons. <laughs> yeah, that, that copper copper is toxic usually for yeah. that. So. Mm -hmm. so we can only use the gold grease here. Were there any other um, tricks or tips that you have for culturing those? So, so neurons can kind of sensitive. I'm just curious. You you have some very nice. Um, cells there. So, mm -hmm. did, was there anything that you found that was like the key or like helpful in growing those cells? Um, I mean, we do coat it those uh, grade with the uh, uh, polydelysing and red talk collagens. Bef like uh, just as we coat the glass covertly before we cut the neuron, and I think that is necessary for the neurons growing on it. And other than that, I think the procedure is pretty similar with what we do when we're using the glass cover sleeves. I just have a comment. I think as uh, this tomography for looking in cells is the most, as a structural biologist, <laughs> the most exciting area, I think, for cryo-EM. And I hope that cell biologists around campus can wake up that this is here and <laughs> using it. So I really appreciate you, uh, you know, Thank using you. this and showing this exciting project. So Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not the structure people, so I, yeah, basically I, I'm not working on the protein structures, but uh, yeah, I mean, just looking at the basic structure for those like smaller, um, like uh, 
smaller, maybe the cells and tissues is also very interesting using the quality. And I still consider that structural biology, if, you know, I think. <laughs> okay. You can, average, you can still average the particles if you. Yes, and it would be more interesting if we specifically looking at uh, the uh, set of skeletons uh, proteins that uh, with the quality, and this is just our first publication, and this is basically screening phase. And in the next phase, we will move to more specific proteins, and we can like visualize them under the quality, and we can get more interesting data. For well, the benefits of those not so experienced, could you make some comments about the processing of the data, specifically how you get to your, your beautiful visualizations? What are the challenges in in actually segmenting and um, visualizing the data? Oh, uh, well, yes. So Bimi helped me a lot during the collection phase, also the data processing phase. And uh, I think for me, the most challenging part is actually the segmentation because because those the, the, the neurons, the axons are big compared to the single particles proteins. So usually our images will have more than 300 stacks and I need to kind of segment them layer by layers. And each layer, it may take me up to like 20 minutes. So it it works, it is really consuming, but, the, but the Avazu was a really powerful tools when I doing those segmentation and uh, they have, some, because like each layer you don't have too much difference. You can actually copy what you have in this layer to the next, and you can like modify it a little bit to fix that the, the next layer, and it can like smooth the outline of what you draw. And uh, yes, there are many details during those segmentation and the data processing phase, but uh, I got a, a lot of help during the process. <laughs> Requires a lot of manual intervention. There isn't. It's not an automated routine to the, to get the segmentation to work. It's not completely automatic. Yeah, and especially for those, I mean, so those cell structures. I think most of the segmentation we still need to do it manually. More of a biological question, but why do you think the mitochondria, like why is there an increase in the mitochondria, like you said, with the puffing? Like, do you know, like biologically, why that is? Well, that is the interesting part, and okay. we are working on. <laughs> yeah, so so we are also, yeah, we just uh, just find that those varicosities are usually formed, uh, like in the position the pre-existing mitochondria, but uh, the mechanism that underlying it, we are like still working on that. Okay. okay, thank you, thank you so much. much. I haven't just can just know yeah you can. Okay. Do I need to share your if you want. Just doing a quick change here. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, everyone ready? All right, so thanks to everyone who spoke before me. Um, Natalia gave a great overview of cryofib, and then we heard some wonderful tomography talks, so I won't go too into detail on either one of those. Um, my talk today focuses on cryofib specifically at CMAS. So again, Natalia already went over this, but why choose cryofib? And we want to use cryofib for sale. Oh. Can you unshare? 
Unshare and reshare, yes. It's fine here, but I mean, How's that? Yeah. Good? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so for TEM, um, we have a thickness limitation of right around 200 nanometers if we want good contrast in our sample. So anything thicker than that, we need a way to thin down the sample to get to our area of interest and then move it to the TEM to collect our high resolution data. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Sorry, my computer is a little bit slow. Okay. So at CMAS, we're equipped with a Helios 600, and this is a gallium focused ion beam with a very high resolution scanning electron microscopy or SEM column. And we've upgraded this with a quorum cryo transfer station and cryo stage, which allows us to transfer a vitreous sample into the microscope, mill, and then retrieve it all under cryo conditions. So as a user, how will you get your cells into the Helios? So far, I'm working with Dan Huber, who is another staff scientist at CMAS, and we've tried a variety of samples um, for adherent cells and shown here, I can get my pointer shown here, are an adherent mammalian cell and bacterial biofilm, we can grow them directly on gold grids. And then we've also worked with yeast suspensions where we deposit a drop of it on the grid before plunge freezing. So once your sample is either happily growing on the grid or we have it in a tube and it's deposited on the grid, we have several different ways where we can get it frozen. So one way is to use the VitroBot, which Natalia already talked about. It's more automated. It's great if you have a large number of samples and you want to get done a little bit more quickly than manual blotting. One con is that it does blot from both sides. So if you have a biofilm or adherent cells growing on the surface of the grid, there is a potential you can actually rip the cells off the grid if you're not very careful. On the other hand, we have manual blotting which is a lot more hands-on. It's not as reproducible depending on who is doing it. You can sometimes get very different results. And it's also very easy to bend the grids if you're not careful. And if the grid is bent, we can't load it into our microscopes. But the benefit of that is you have more control over how you're blotting. So you can blot from behind, you can blot from the edge of the grid, whatever works best for your sample. So once your sample is on the grid, um, we blot off the excess buffer. It's optional. We can add stain, and the stain I commonly use is urinal acetate. And this is to give a little bit more contrast and also help improve the conductivity of the sample. We blot off stain and then immediately plunge freeze the grid into a pot of liquid ethane. And then we store the grid at liquid nitrogen temperatures until we're ready to image it. For the specific holder that we have, um, we've tried a bunch of different grids. We've tried just flat grids. We've tried these clamshell grids that fold over larger samples, so like millimeter scale. And we found that the best and easiest way to get them in the microscope safely is to use just traditional TEM grids and do a process called clipping, where we put the grids in this metal ring and then add a C-clip on top to hold it in place. So this provides some rigidity to the grid and also helps it stay in the cryo holder much easier than a naked TEM grid. So currently we're accepting a variety of samples. So I mentioned mammalian cells, biofilms, yeast. We've also worked with some very large bacterial samples on a millimeter scale. Um, we're working on on-grid thinning right now, where we bind our cell with our region of interest, mill away 
all the unwanted areas and we're left with a very thin window. And then from there, we can move it into our cryo TEM and do our tilt series. We're also working on cryo CLEM, and this is correlative light and electron microscopy. So in this technique, the sample was grown directly on a TEM grid, and we use fluorescence to narrow down the area of the grid where we want to focus our milling. So not every cell was expressing the fluorescent protein of interest. So we wanted to focus our efforts on the cells that were. And so we were able to do that and find the same area and then mill just there. And still more work in progress. Um, CMAS was recently awarded a grant to purchase this cryo micro manipulator. And that gives us the capability to do that lamella lift out that Natalia mentioned earlier. So for very, very thick samples where on-grid milling would take days, here we can mill our area of interest from an extremely thick sample, lift out the lamella, move it to a fresh grid, and then put that grid into our creos. So what can you do with a technique like this? And here's some work from the Baumeister and Plitzko groups where they've used um, the, the same micro manipulator that we have now at CMAS to lift out a section of a C. elegans worm. So first they used fluorescent microscopy to find their area of interest, used FibSem to mill away and get a thin lamella, use the micro manipulators to lift out that lamella and then put it on a TEM grid and from there, they collected their tilt series and were able to generate high resolution structures from within a cell. So that's all I have, just a very brief overview of what we can do here at CMAS. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact either myself or Dan Huber. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has. Thank you. Can you say something about the, particularly on, on the last topic, on the question of if you have a larger piece of material, a tissue sample from, you know, how, how, how large a sample can you get away with one freezing before you really need to think of, as Natalia indicated, high pressure freezing or alternative sources? It's a very good question. So we've tried plunge freezing larger things on the scale of, you know, right around here, 30 microns or more. And what we found is that the outer layers were vitreous, but as we cut into the thinner areas, right where we want to get the lamella, it was very crystalline. So I would say adhere at mammalian cells at about 10 microns thick, we can still get away with plunge freezing. Anything thicker than that, like tissues and those larger bacteria that I mentioned earlier that were millimeter scale, we, we need to move into high pressure freezing. How does, how does that work, that part of the workflow work? I mean, I know we don't have much experience with that, but how does high pressure freezing feed into that workflow and what are the challenges ultimately there that you would face? So high pressure freezing, um, the high pressure freezer that I've worked with in the past came with a variety of different holders. So finding the right holder for your sample would be step one. Um, from there, the high pressure freezing itself is pretty automated these days. You just wanna minimize the amount of air in the sample holder. So either get the right size for your sample or fill it with some kind of buffer. Usually we use a high percentage of BSA. I know Natalia may have used something different. Yes, yeah, and then we high pressure freeze it. So that enables us to get mostly vitreous ice very quickly. And then from there, we have different holders on our cryo stage that can accommodate these planchettes. So from there, it would again be a matter of getting it into the helios, milled and getting it out of the helios. And I should mention this whole business of transferring in and out of the helios is not as trivial as it 
Let me look here. So we need to move pretty quickly during this. And Dan does a great job of troubleshooting and monitoring, making sure our vacuum is good. Because we also want to minimize ice contamination. So the longer your sample is out in air, the higher the chance for ice contamination. So we want to get it into the Helios, milled, out of the Helios, back in liquid nitrogen as quickly as possible. I want to read you about that. You have, I, I don't even know if you can see that in the audio. You have a, some kind of uh, integrated fluorescent light microscope there? Not in our Helios. Okay. And I don't even know if you have enough ports to install that there. I we know. do have some free ports on our Helios. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if we'll go that route. So for now, we're doing but all. Yeah, for now, we're doing our fluorescent imaging at another core facility here at Ohio State at room temperature. Oh, okay. And from there, driving it over to CMAS, plunge right. freezing, and then putting in the helios. Yeah. Yeah. Bit of a challenge. Yeah. So I think for context for all of our users online as well as those in the room and following on what Chuck was saying, you know, I think we can see the tremendous excitement if we were able to get these kinds of um, data from, you know, either inside the cell or, or indeed from specific areas of tissue. And we can see the bit of relevance to, you know, clinical type work, especially as it relates to the cancer center. So for context, you know, we have previously applied for NIH S10 support to create that kind of workflow. And the feedback was that really we didn't have preliminary data. So what Giovanna and Dan Huber are doing in these hero experiments is really using equipment that was never designed to do this kind of work and finding a way to do it. Okay. But the goal ultimately it would be to say, well, now that we can do this, we really need the right equipment. Um, the justification for that needs to come from our user base. So the appeal that you know I would make out there to the user base to the, the people online, whether they're PIs or whether you go and speak to your PI, if this is the type of work that you really want to do in 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, now is the time to be coming to us and saying, you know, I really have a fantastic application. This would have a huge impact. You know, how can I support you in trying to get the equipment here that would give us that correlative workflow for both for cryo and indeed for correlative light and electron microscopy? But that's my appeal out there for the community for those of you listening. Yeah, and just as Dave said, Dan and I, we're working on a variety of samples right now. So we've done mammalian cells, biofilms, extremely large bacteria, and yeast. So the more variety I think we have, the better at this point, as we're still working on streamlining everything. Um, I think we've got the transfer down. We can get things in and out quickly. We can do, Dan is an expert at, you know, milling, milling parameters. And then we've got Bin Bin, who's an expert in tomography. So we have the right team in place. I think we just need more samples now. And, and what is the, the dream equipment or the, the, the we, we get? The, the, Do you want to answer that or what? For me? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm a big fan of PLEM. I would love the integrated fluorescence. Um, that would minimize the whole bond luck of having the image and then hurry up and get to CMAS while keeping your cells happy and then plunge freezing. I am surprised that you can do that so well. I mean, it's crazy. So, so I, yeah, that would be the great place for you, like Christmas before Christmas, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then um, the Helios that we have is primarily used for room temperature material science work. So getting it ready, cooled down, doing our cryos work and then getting it warm back up, that takes a significant amount of time too. So just in general, having a dedicated cryo instrument that we could keep cold all the time would be very helpful. I think too, if you think of the things that we're missing, Scott, and for the rest of it, you know, 
We don't have a high pressure freezer. To my knowledge, there isn't a high pressure freezer anywhere on campus, which is ridiculous, I think, for yes. your University of Arcadale. The one that we had was gifted to us by Procter and Gamble and has now died. Um, you know, so if we're going to look at tissues, we're going to need we, yeah, if we're going to look at thicker samples, we need it. Critical. I think correlative light electron microscopy is critical for identifying real functionality. Uh, and as Giovanna said, although, you know, uh, Giovanna and Dan have done, like I say, hero experiments to, to make this workflow work, we're doing it in a system that's really designed for physical sciences research. And it has major disadvantages, but and it's one of our heaviest used instruments for physical sciences. There are instruments out there that are more optimized for this type of workflow, specifically for life sciences. So I think the answer to your question would be, you know, a high pressure freezer, curve of light electron, a curve of light cryo light imaging system, plus you know, an optimized fit. To enable to, to really do this transfer in a very straightforward and um, robust routine way. Um, and you're probably for all of that looking at you know an S10 that's a million, million plus. So are there any last questions? Is there anything on the chat? Okay. All right, well, thank you all for your attention. Okay, so we're going to take another. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take another quick break um, and be back with Chuck in, well, let's say, let's say five minutes. I think. Great. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Yes, well, that's. Um, all right, there we go. Okay, so thanks for your patience, everyone. Chuck Bell is here to present on his single particle project. And um, and then I, this is Yoshi, will be giving a very brief um, few slides about starting projects and a little bit more about how you can get started at CMS. So Chuck, take it away. Okay. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. I think my 2015 Mac can still do cryo EM and crystallography <laughs> and works very well, but apparently uh, presentation mode can be challenging. So uh, Yoshi asked me, she had a very specific criteria and email of what she wanted me to do. And I think I'm going to do most of that, but really I wanted to tell my story of my project and I'm going to try to breeze over the science and not clog down with that, but tell my story about how cryo EM saved the world for me anyway. Um, and it's kind of embarrassing, but we just now finally have our first publication from this work and it's in a good journal. And um, so uh, it's in the press. And what part of what took so long is that there's all this biochemistry and the reviewers wanted us to mutants and Caroline Karbowski here, uh, one of the authors uh, made like 45 mutations and purified all those proteins and to, you know how reviewers are, right? So, <laughs> so the, but, um, yeah, um, so just briefly, the project, it's a DNA recombination from bacteriophage lambda, but the, the proteins are exciting because they're used in genetic engineering and there's human versions that are relevant to cancer. Um, so one of the proteins is a nuclease, the yellow shaped ring that um, binds the ends of DNA and chews up one of the strands. And then it interacts with a recombinase that it loads the green one onto the three prime overhang of the of the DNA. And I'm having trouble with the pointer here, but anyway, um, the so the the ring shaped protein we could very easily it looks like a simple small thing. It's about 75 kilodaltons. It's a tri trimer. It could very easily be crystallized. And in 2011. Uh, we were able to get crystals and solve its structure, and it's a beautiful nuclease structure that shows all the chemistry and how it mo motors processively along the DNA. But the green protein is a lot more messy, and so it binds to DNA, and it and it does strand annealing, so it can anneal complementary strands of DNA. And uh, as shown on the cartoon diagram here, it oligomerizes on the DNA, 
and and a very famous electron microscopist, Ed Eggelman, um, uh, who's at Virginia in 1999, got the first images of this protein. It's called Rad Beta from Bacteriophage Lambda. The human protein is called Rad 52. For if anybody's here from the Cancer Center, but um, what he did in this figure is he took long heat denatured double stranded DNA, so like from a plasmid about four kilobases of DNA and heat denatured and added it to the protein. And he saw rings and filaments. And this is negative stain EM, very low resolution. You can't see much more detail than this at this time. Um, but the rings are thought to bind a single strand of DNA, which I call the substrate. And the filaments are thought to bind to um, a duplex version of DNA that is some mysterious intermediate of this DNA annealing process. And you can see here in the figure, the rings tend to uh, start and then the filaments kind of grow out of the rings as if this annealing process started on the ring, but then was extended by a filament. And so my goal, I, I started at OSU in 2001, um, was to get higher resolution structures of this. And at that time, the only way you could do it was crystallography really essentially for this. So for 15 years and at least, and at least a million dollars, we tried to grow crystals of, of the protein with DNA, of variants of the protein, domains, all the usual tricks structural biologists use. Um, and we got crystals and they were big and they were beautiful and they had the DNA in them because we put a blue CY5 D on the, uh, dye on the end of the DNA and they diffracted somewhat, but we could never get structures. And the unit cells are quite large. So we knew we had something very interesting. And the problem with crystallography is that if you don't actually solve it, you don't get any information on what it actually looks like. You don't know, you know, but we knew we had something interesting. Um, so of course then, it, so look, keep in mind, I keep showing dates here. This is around 2016. And by around 2012, crystallographers were on to the fact that gee, there were this new direct electron detectors. And, and then this article is from 2015. Finally, it was just blatantly obvious that we needed to do cryo-EM to solve this project. And uh, Yifan Chang was here last Tuesday or this Tuesday, some, and showed this same slide. So I'm not, I didn't steal it from him, but it's a very famous slide. So the problem was, is that we didn't have the equipment here. And us crystallographers are kind of like, okay, how do we do this? Do we have to do a sabbatical, you know, somewhere else? And thankfully, David McComb, uh, the director of CMOS, came to the rescue. Now, CMOS actually was is world renowned for material science EM back in this day, uh, back in 2016, 17. And uh, David was very kind and invited me to early meetings. And, and I remember two things um, is that one, uh, there were all these discussions where are we going to get the money? And Sorry to tell you, I don't, these are not um, uh, official quotes here, but just ballpark figures of what I remember back in the day of what it costs a lot of money. And, and one thing I remember is that within magically, somehow Dave pulled it all together and all of a sudden we had money, you know, from the Cancer Center, from Dean Williams at the College of Engineering and many, many other, other sources. And the other thing I remember that Dave said was that we don't want just what everybody else has. We want the best, like <laughs> kind of like I think of Spinal Tap, you know, this one goes to 11, right? So our, our Creos here, I think Yifan even mentioned, he said they have the best microscope here. So it's got all the face plates, the CS correction, the energy filter, everything. So um, I guess these days there's probably a K4, but um, in any case, uh, so this was 2017. Um, and we also have the screen and microscope. And this is a picture I took of my graduate student who solved the cryoam structure. Um, he's very tall and a body weightlifter, but the Creos towers over him. So, and there it is with its guts all open so you can see it. Um, okay, so I did, before we got the equipment and the time that I was waiting, all the negative stain getting used to preparing samples. And I was looking for this image and I had to look through about 20 folders of days that I'd gone over and done negative stain. So. It was hard, but finally, this was a breakthrough for me, getting ribosomes to look beautiful, like the ones, not as nice as the ones Natalia showed, but pretty close, yeah. So, uh, but this is still very low resolution negative stain. And when we first got the glacios, I remember I was privy, fortunate to be uh, in and collected data. What I mean to show here is that cryo-EM can go very fast if it works. Um, and especially if your particle is, is like spherical, um, uh, 
So ribosomes are well known. We've seen pictures of them many times today already, but they're spherical. They, they don't have preferred orientation. They sit well. And the very first VitroBot session and uh, that I did, it worked. And this data was collected on the glacios. And if it wasn't a huge ribosome, and if we collected it in the creos, I could have solved and published this structure quickly. But it would have taken me at least two months or two years to build a model for a ribosome. So anyway, but I mean, my main point is that my first experiment, it worked. And it can go very fast. And these were very perfect images, I think, for what we had. My figure there, I didn't at this time know how to use Chimera to set it right to show the beautiful map, but trust me, you could see RNA and DNA and protein and everything. Okay. Um, okay, so now our protein that I showed you the previous picture of, we were preparing samples in similar ways and it didn't go so well. So we spent about two years struggling with this. Um, and the problem was preferred orientation. You've heard that today, but um, it formed these C-shaped structures. We didn't get the filaments like we wanted. And I think something bad was happening at the air-water interface, but we could at least see something. We saw wedge-shaped sub subunits. We saw in the 2D class averages, but because we didn't have all of the views that Natalia showed in her beautiful movies, um, we, we, could, we couldn't get a three-dimensional uh, structure. Um, so we tried, fortunately, we had all these homologs in the freezer and we tried them and Brian blew through them and quickly got to this beautiful image that shows filaments you can see. And we solved it to high resolution. The, the resolution is technically 3.4, but in EM, it's, it's higher than what you're used to from crystallography because you, the phase, there's no phase problem. The phases are perfect. And you can see that in these electron density maps on the lower right, um, where you see perfect side chains and base pairs and so forth. Um, in our structure, we see filaments. And I, I just want to blow through the science part, but the DNA is in yellow and orange. And it's bound to a deep groove along the outside of the filament. And it's very extended and it's completely unwound. And this is a completely novel structure of DNA. They won't let me use the word novel in the journal, but, um, but it's never been seen before. And, um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to these show the typical ribbon diagrams and I don't want to dwell on uh, this, but, um, you know, to get this complex, we added, we gave the protein, it's a 35 kilodalton protein, one strand of 83 mer DNA. And we let it sit at 30, we actually heated it to 37 degrees Celsius. And then we added the second complementary DNA and it forms this night type complex. The first strand, we call it the inner strand and it's the yellow one bound deep inside there. The second one is the orange one and we call it the outer strand. So the protein bound to the yellow strand and annealed it to the orange strand. Um, and there's the monomer and it's homologous to the human protein. The human protein has been crystal structure solved, but just bound to one DNA, not bound to both DNAs. And so there's been a question in the field of how does it actually anneal DNA? We know it binds DNA. Um, and you can see all the details of the protein-protein interactions, and there's a close-up view of the DNA. And really, this is a novel confirmation of DNA. Um, there's a side view of, of just the DNA and orange and yellow, it's hard to distinguish them, but the yellow strand, if you look at the top view, is always on the inside. And so it's the strands aren't wound around, it's completely unwound DNA. Even the material scientists, I think, that have seen DNA know that this is a very unusual confirmation. That's not what supposed, DNA is supposed to look like. But we think this confirmation is fundamental to the process of protein catalyzed single strand annealing in the cell. Um, uh, I'm going to skip the movie, but we have a beautiful movie. You can go to the Nature Communications paper and download that and look at it. That's what caused all the problems, I think, because it's a huge file. It's a beautiful movie. Um, I do want to emphasize this. Uh, native mass spectrometry was key to this project. And we have Zihao uh, here from Vicky Wysocki's lab. Um, and uh, Andrew Norris, who's graduated and moved on to Switzerland, I think. Uh, but um, I'm not showing the spectra, but what this plot shows is the number of protein subunits going from left to right. And it shows different samples in the different rows. And then the color coding shows how many copies of DNA, of our 83 mer DNA. And you can see at the top is the protein alone, doesn't oligomerize at all. Um, but then as you add one DNA, 
it forms uh, two different types of complexes. I call them, Vicky hates this, but I call them the green complexes that only have, it's an 83 mer DNA, they only have eight to nine subunits. And then the blue copies, which have the full set of, of, of subunits. And then if you give it the two complementary genes, so the purple complexes on the lower right are what we solved in the, in the cryo-M. And there's five, in the structure, there's five nucleotides of DNA per monomer of protein. And if you divide 83 by five, you get very close to 16 and 17. So in any case, the, the main point here is that Vicky has a, a program project grant from, native, from NIH to um, uh, integrate you know, uh, native mass spec with cryo-M and how to screen samples. And that's a very um, advantage, another advantage we have here at OSU and that that technology really uh, provided new insights into um, you know, how to not just validate the structure, but also uh, analyze our sample to develop strategies to get structures. And even this is newer technology, Vicky's developing ways to actually spray directly from the mass spec, um, the green, say, complex directly onto a grid and analyze. So you could actually separate those two structures. And this is brand new methods. And it's been done for negative stain for GrowEL. Um, they're working on cryo and so forth, but that's even future, further into the future, I think, something that's very excited that we proposed in our grant application. Um, so, uh, yeah. How do you think you saw all um, four types of semi-clumps, like, in, the, in your classes? So, our, our structure was just the purple complexes. Okay. Um, and I neglected to mention this, but some of the filaments were long. And they they can stack end to end. The filaments on 83 mers can stack end to end. And we didn't use helical averaging at all. It was all just single particle. So the particles that we used were the single filaments that were less than the full. That there were larger species on there that we didn't use. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have a structure with just one DNA, and it's in the paper. I didn't show it here, but it's we think it's the blue species, but it may be some of the green too. But it's not as well organized and it's lower resolution as the mass spec says. Um, the mass spec says perfectly, yes, you need both strands to get that tight ordered complex. Okay. And we've worked on the human protein uh, that is a, it's relevant to cancer. It's a cancer target and it forms rings, not filaments, which is unusual, but this has DNA and the structure hasn't been solved with the two DNAs and we're working on that, but we have beautiful uh, 2D class averages and, and so forth. Okay, so I wanted to get to the acknowledgements and um, let's see here. So in my lab, Brian Caldwell, who I showed, the big guy next to the Krios next to Yoshi, um, uh, was a graduate student that um, really did phenomenal work and had great hands and, and did all this. Um, not without help that I'll mention here in a minute from CMOS, but um, a former graduate, Chris Smith is unfortunately for him, worked on all the pure protein purification of all the homologs that were in the freezer and trying to grow crystals and uh, other things. Caroline is, is here that did the, got the paper out the door with the mutagenesis. And this project has been funded for three cycles by NSF. Um, we have a new one. So we're over at CMOS a lot spending money over there. Anyway, a new data collection and a training grant for Brian. And we also got, I hope they still have these, uh, CCC micro award that enabled this project to really collect a lot of data and troubleshoot all this. And from the Waisaki lab, Andrew was, was integral and Zihao now is pushing, sorry, I left you out here, but she, there's our program project grant number. Okay, now to CMOS. Um, these are the four people that I already showed Dave, um, but uh, that, that I interacted with the most and, and um, kind of in the order from top left. Uh, Hank uh, has a course, um, and I think everybody pitches in on this now, but. Brian took the course and it really shows you how an electron microscope works. And believe me, it's a lot more complicated for me anyways than an X-ray diffractometer or even a synchrotron, I feel like. But um, in any case, um, it's a wonderful course and he, he can train users how to use the, the non-cryo T20 or whatever it is, T30 um, here at CMOS. Um, and he's kind of always around and, and problem solving. He's the smartest guy I know, maybe tied with Dave. Uh, okay, <laughs> actually. Um, okay, and then Bin Bin was here, I remember very early on. I think she showed me how to use the Vitrobot for the first time, but she actually had a lot of experience in cryo going way back. Um, 
from her postdoc years, I think at Baylor and, and grad student or in Texas, wasn't it? Yeah. PhD, okay, yeah, yeah, um, with one of the most famous cryo-EM, but, um, you know, it was kind of, before we even had the equipment, that's, I remember she had the expertise in cryo-EM, the know-how, and then Yoshi, um, you know, was there early on as well, and run, runs the Creos, uh, that's kind of what I think of her as doing, but I'm sure it's a lot more than that, but any, once you're finally got everything ready to go, and you want to collect the best data, uh, Yoshi helps with that, now, Giovanna came on a little later, maybe two, three years ago, was, and I, I kind of tended to think of her as the sample prep expert. And, and if you noticed, I put the date of when we actually, I was, I didn't mention these dates, but I think this was like a couple months after, or six months after Giovanna, and I don't think there's a coincidence um, there that we got these beautiful images shortly. So she helps with sample prep. And I appreciate all the help I've gotten and yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I don't have the but yeah, no, I have the Okay. So so let me ask you when you know, as you illustrated, you know, your first experiment went very well. You thought, hey, cry the M's easy. And then you start into this project and you said, you know, we identified, you know, that we basically were suffering from, you know, preferential orientations and things. But how long did it take you to go from, you know, I, I know I've got a good protein or I've got a good sample and I'm getting terrible data. But how long did it take you to actually conclude it was because of the preferential orientation and how did you get there? I mean, I feel like we still don't know exactly. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious here that we have preferred orientation. Um, so we tried uh, detergents, we tried changing the length of the DNA and and all the all the things. We didn't try graphene grids yet. Um, we didn't try tilting. We talked about doing it, but people were kind of like, oh, um, that's a last resort. Um, but um, not, not people here, but just, I, I don't know. Um, uh, it, but it did take us about two years to, and, and ultimately what worked for us was changing the sample. So use the same thing, which is the same thing you kind of try with crystallography. Um, we just happened to have them all in the freezer. I kept nagging Brian, hey, try the new other homologs. We have like in the freezer, you know, a different protein. My, and I think it was this one was actually falling apart. I feel like the filaments were there, but they were falling apart at the air water interface. And actually another group um, published um, a structure of this one, but he, they used um, just a fragment of the protein, not the full length protein. And they came out, his came out a, a month or so earlier, but um, we were in a lot of communication. So, and they, they form filaments that are very similar to ours, but um, they don't have the full length. Ours has a lot more information than theirs, but it don't, anyway, yeah, so. That question. Are you still working with this specific protein or, or not anymore? Um, uh, well, we do a lot of, of other research with it. We haven't tried cryo. I mean, I wish I had eight students, you know, and we could fully occupy the Vietro bot and Glacio's time. And, um, you know, I think, um, you know, we were, once we got it to work with the one, and I forgot to mention the homolog, but it's from Listeria inocua prophage. It doesn't really matter, you know, but um, we, we've, we're doing a lot more with that one. Yeah. Okay. So the one that works, yeah. But they're very different, actually, like 10% sequence identity. And the human one is, to, so they're, the human one is, has a similar core fold, but it's 10% identical. So they're, it's kind of interesting when you study lots of different variants that are very divergent, but to see what the common core features are for function. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Thank you. Should I take this out? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, you're fine. Okay, so I'm not going to take up too much time. I just have a couple, um, few slides here. So let me stop sharing this. Oh, I lost my bar.
Jocelyn is like, okay, okay, great. So um, this is kind of to build off of um, Chuck's story here. So you can actually see his structure is um, there on the left, the second one. So um, as Dave has mentioned, um, since full, like installing the Creos and having everything installed in spring of 2019, um, our users have been very productive in terms of um, solving single particle structures. Um, so this is just showing you a variety. There's membrane proteins, there's um, you know, globular proteins, there's all sorts of um, different types of structures that our users have solved. And so we're kind of proud to show, um, you know, the, the results of all of their hard work. And we think that's a function of, you know, the quality of the microscopes and the facility that we have. So we really want to encourage anyone that is interested, not just in single particle, but in any type of cryo-EM capability that Natalia discussed um, to definitely meet with us or, or get in touch with us. Um, I'm also putting this slide up here so you can get an idea of the colleagues, the people that you work with that are also doing cryo EM. Um, I put this up here because I think that's kind of the best way to build this community, right, is to know who else is doing cryo EM work. So not just um, single particle analysis, but also tomography and micro ED. Um, so I'm just highlighting here the principal investigators from the College of Medicine and the Comprehensive Cancer Center. So there are more users in this, um, but the, these are the, um, the ones that are located here on the biomedical side of campus. Um, we also have a pretty strong contingent from pharmacy and chemistry and biochemistry. Um, so definitely if you see any of these people and you have projects with them or um, you, know, you have similar research interests, I would definitely um, also get in touch with them. So just to summarize, so in terms of the capabilities, so nanoparticle characterization, which is like the liposomes, EVs, um, that type of thing, you're just doing sort of conventional cryo-TEM imaging, um, and single particle analysis I hi highlighted in green, mostly because I consider those closer to routine for us to be able to do at our facility. So um, the other, so here, <laughs> <laughs> um, I would consider tomography and micro ED to be more sort of in a development phase where you would really have to work very closely with us um, to get those projects kind of um, off the ground and they're a little less routine. Um, Natalia did mention this in her presentation, but I don't want to underemphasize it, <laughs> um, but you do have to put some consideration into thinking about how you're going to process data, any data that you collect at our facility. And in the case of single particle analysis, that could be thousands of micrographs, um, hundreds of micrographs that have to be individually segmented by hand. So all of that is very um, time consuming um, and is an important part of obviously the final research product. So it's something that you should consider as you're thinking about um, starting your own cryo-EM project. Um, we are always, as Giovanna mentioned, interested in developing new methods um, and finding areas for collaboration. So if um, any of you saw something that you were interested in, in terms of cryofib, cryo-ET, cryo um, or cryoclem, even please reach out to us because um, it, could it may become more important as we talk about external funding opportunities down the line. Um, so I guess the main thing is we just want to sort of um, put forth the realistic expectation of what it's going to be like if you start a cryo -EM project. Obviously, it's very exciting, um, but it does require a significant amount of time, um, not just in sort of research dollars, but also in your trainee time and how you're going to, um, you know, put your human resources into the project. Okay, so with that being said, um, if you want to start a project, there are several internal funding opportunities that we want to highlight. So Chuck did mention the CCC micro awards. If your project has any cancer relevance, we highly encourage you to apply for that. It's up to a $10,000 voucher that can be sent, um, spent towards a, your cryo project. Um, um, some of you may also be familiar with the IMR, which is the Institute for Materials Research Kickstarter facility grant, where you can also um, have $2,500 to spend at CMAS. And then lastly is the CZTS. Um, I'm not loading the CS right now. Let's see, my mouse is not going up here. 
okay, we'll just ignore that. Um, the CCCT, uh, CCTS core services voucher support. So that's up to $3,000. And I think the Tadeshi group, which is doing cryo ET, used that for um, cryo ET. So please look into those um, if you are interested and want to get some preliminary data. I think that's a good place um, to start. Um, so I think some of the frequently asked questions, I'm not going to go over all these, but um, a lot of common ones. Um, so if I want to get preliminary data for a grant application, let's say, what, what do I need to know? So as Dave mentioned, start early, right? So get in touch with us early if you need preliminary data. I would also say if you can provide us a realistic goal of what you want to achieve um, for this grant. So for example, if it's a single particle um, project, you know, I think it's very reasonable to say, I would like to put in some 2D classes, maybe some nice micrographs of your particles in ice, something like that. Um, and then we can also, you should definitely consult with us um, to budget what you would need for your grant. So let's say you're successful um, in getting NIH funding, then you can sort of put in the correct amount that you need for microscope time, staff time, things like that. Um, I did briefly mention external opportunities. Um, so we did put together an NIH S10 proposal, which would be for a dedicated FIB for life sciences work. Um, and we did, that was scored and we got some good feedback on that. But um, as Dave mentioned, having sort of more um, examples or preliminary data for that would only strengthen our argument. So um, we put that on pause for now, but we would like if anybody is listening as an R01 funded researcher or even a new PI, um, if they're interested in the cryofib work, please get in touch with us. And then I also wanted to highlight the NIH common fund sources. So there are three cryo, national cryo-EM centers and there's four newly established cryo-ET centers. And these resources are great. So some of our users use our facility and then also jointly use the national labs to collect more data. Um, they have great training resources, um, even for, for example, like instrument managers like us, we could go get more training, um, lots of workshops and data processing things. So definitely check them out. Um, it's, it's free, but you do have to apply for um, these opportunities. So something to keep in mind. Um, people also always ask about rates. Um, all of our rates are published on our website, but just to give you an idea of the hourly rate for screening on the Glacios, as well as um, individual data collection sessions, which are roughly um, 24 hours of the full day of time. So those are our internal rates. Um, if you have an interest in becoming an independent user, so let's say you're a grad student, trainee, you want to um, make cryoEM part of your um, sort of part of your grad experience, then you would want to become an independent user. And you can just, if you go to our website, there's a big, there's a big image right in the middle. You just click on it and start that process. Here's what um, I found. Oh, Mary Stockman. Um, as Chuck mentioned, unfortunately, Hank is retiring at the end of this week. So Hank will not be around, but Naria um, Bagos is our new sort of, um, not replacement, I won't say, but she is taking over the TEM and SEM courses that are available at CMAS. So this is a great way for grad students to get um, training, like essentially a driver's license to use those instruments. And it's integrated as part of your coursework. So your PI doesn't have to pay for separate training time. Um, so those are offered both in the fall and spring. So definitely check them out. It's through material science. Um, again, that's also in our website, so you can find it there. Um, and most important, please reach out to us if you have any questions, you want to set up a meeting, you just want to talk about potential projects or ideas. Um, those are all the instrument managers for the cryoEM instrumentation, or you can send a general email to see now. So I think Giovanna put this slide up as well, but all the ways to contact us, um, reach out in any, in any of those ways. <laughs> um, and that is pretty much all we have planned for like the formal program here. If you guys have any questions in the room or Zoom, I can't see it right now, but um, just go ahead and throw those up. But other than that, that's all we have. So any other questions? <laughs> okay. Jocelyn, is there anything on? No, we're good. Okay. I will say, um, let me stop sharing real quick. For those that are interested in 
Um, let me turn my video. Okay, so those of you that are interested in coming to CMS now that we're done. Um, so we will be having lunch over there. Um, if you're in this room and you need a ride, <laughs> there are plenty of CMS staff members who are here. I'm me as well. Um, you can also take the campus connector from the Herrick Hub and get off at Research Center. That's another option as well. We're very friendly people though, so you're welcome to come come with me. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and then we'll also do a, a tour if anybody's interested in checking. Yeah, I think the Creos is collecting data right now, but we can definitely go um, check out the Glacios and the and our sample prep area, all that stuff. So um, we will reconvene out at CMS and let us know if you need help with directions and whatnot. So, but that's it. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>